All right, I think I think we're good. Why don't Why don't we get started now? Um, welcome everybody to IHA's webinar. This is called Using Photo Novellas to Build Knowledge. My name is Julie McKinney. I'm going to be moderating, um, but mostly it's going to be our two speakers today, Rena Brar Priaga and Melissa Morales. Um, welcome, Rena and Melissa. We're really happy to have you here for this webinar, um, and I'm really excited about the, the webinar. We've been talking about photo novellas in the health literacy sphere for many, many years, and um, it's rarely addressed directly um, in webinars like this. So I'm very excited that you two are here to talk about it. Um, and um, let's just, I'm just gonna do some very quick housekeeping. You guys are all used to this, and then we will let Rena and Marissa, Melissa get started. Um, so, um, you know, I'm sure you all know, connect to audio using your computer speakers. You will all be muted during the webinar, but please um, feel free to ask questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, all the way on the right. Um, you, you are welcome to, to, to comment and, um, and share stuff in the chat. So please feel free to use that. But if you have questions for the speakers, it's a little easier for them if you use the Q&A for your questions. So um, please do that. Um, if there's any technical difficulties, um, you, there's the email is here on your screen. It's support at healthliteracysolutions.org. Um, the webinar will be recorded and posted um, in the Health Literacy Solutions Center webinar page archive. So you will see that um, soon afterwards. Um, after the webinar, if you're looking for CEU credits, um, you'll get an email with a link to a brief online evaluation. Um, so if you requested those uh, when you registered, please submit the evaluation, look for it in your email, and then you will get your certificate. Um, and um, so with that, I think that's pretty much all we need to know. Um, so I'm very pleased to welcome Rena and Melissa. Rena Brar-Prayaga is a behavioral data scientist and an advisor at Impulse Mobile with over 15 years of experience conducting research, evaluation and analytics in education and healthcare. She is the scientific lead on how individuals and populations interact and engage with mobile solutions. Melissa Morales is a strategic account director at Impulse. Prior to Impulse, she was in the account manager at clinic and clinical solutions lead at Collective Medical, which is a care collaboration software sold to payers and providers. She has a wealth of experience in account management, technical implementations and developing strategic initiatives with clients. She's also a licensed clinical social worker and worked as a medical social worker for 10 years before transitioning to the IT health world. So Rena and Melissa, welcome and you guys take it away. Thank you so much for that intro, Julie. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, really looking forward and happy to be here. Um, we're gonna do a quick introduction about Impulse and who we are. So we are a company that's been around for about 10 years. And what we do is that we engage patients and members via omni-channel solutions. So this is through texting, SMS, IVR or automated calls, emails, streaming health education videos. To the, and the purpose here is really to drive, help drive improved outcomes for patients. We deliver meaningful health education experiences to help change behavior through expert-led videos, um, whether it's appointment reminders, conducting health risk assessments, um, helping with medication adherence, and preventative care. You can see here that we have a wealth of uh, large payers and providers that we work with, over 100 clients and customers. You can go to the next slide. Perfect. So at Impulse, the purpose of our company is really to reimagine health engagement. So we first do this by having conversations with patients and members of plans. This really helps to understand their needs and meeting them where they're at, which is something that is very um, key to me as a, with my background in social work. So realizing that there's times where we need to help uh, patients or members change their behaviors or health behaviors. And a way that we do this is by building knowledge. So we were able to do this by sending bite-sized pieces of information, again, via the, any of those channels that we talked about, 
Um, we can direct patients and members to specific areas, so sending them to specific links, uh, sending health education videos, depending on whether they have a chronic disease or whatever they might be um, needing ass additional assistance with. And even uh, at times we ask them to complete, again, health questionnaires to provide us more um, insight to where they're at. Um, we actually even offer a digital learning experience um, and access to our suite of health education streaming library. So think of it as health education, but in a, in a Netflix type of world. So when we look at this, we don't wanna do it for just one topic or just reach out to these patients or members um, once a year. We wanna to continue to develop a relationship that covers the holistic patient or member journey. Um, across a multitude of topics, we can converse with members one-on-one, -on -one. Um, we help understand their needs and really give them the knowledge that they need to empower them to make better healthcare decisions. Um, at the end of the day, what we really do is that um, we help support, again, driving these outcomes um, that our account partners or health plan or provider partners want their patients or members to achieve. So ultimately creating a positive experience for the patient and results for uh, the providers and the plans. Okay, Rena, I think you can go to the next slide. Perfect. Okay. And I'm gonna turn the time over to Rena now to cover a bit of our agenda and uh, the additional program. Hi everyone, I'm really excited to be here um, to talk about mobile photonovelas and the relevance they might have for many of you. Um, we're going to start by talking very briefly about health literacy and health beliefs. Talk about what exactly this thing is. What is a mobile photonovela? Um, it's kind of unique. We, we've seen a lot of print photonovelas, but not really mobile photonovelas. So that's what we're so interested in sharing with you today. And then talk a bit about how people have actually engaged with these photonovelas. Are people enjoying them? What are some of the feedback we're getting? And finally, how to actually deploy what that process is of actually creating one of these photonovelas. So I'm going to start by talking about, by really highlighting um, the critical role of health literacy as a, basically as a predictor of health outcomes. Um, as most of you know, patients with lower health literacy are more likely to visit the ER, to have more hospital stays, and to have higher mortality rates. So the definition of health literacy expanded in 2020 and now emphasizes the role of the organization and of society to provide individuals with accessible, comprehensible and usable information. And that shift, it very much mirrors what we are trying to do um, to, to make sure that the quality and accessibility of information can be improved by combining words and images in photonovelas or visual stories. Let's look again at how that definition has evolved. The old definition was more concerned with obtaining and understanding basic health information. The new definition talks about finding, understanding, and as you can see, using information. So there's that actionable element here. Um, and as you can see, the organization is also a part of this now since they are expected to equitably enable individuals to find, understand, and again, use that health information for health-related decisions and action. So Rena, how can organizations use this information to help enable um, equity? So that's, that, that is a, that's an actually a great question. And that's what we were grappling with um, when we designed our first photonovela campaign back in March 2020, um, around the same time the standards were being implemented. And that's a time that many of you probably remember quite vividly. March 2020 is also the beginning of, of COVID, of the pandemic. Um, basically, we wanted to help our partner organizations reduce barriers and address health beliefs. And at the same time, be helping members and patients use that information and make well-informed decisions. Our primary goal, of course, was to make sure that the actual outreach was equitable and easy to understand. And one measure that we use at Impulse, and a very good one, is the level of engagement. Our health plans and patients responding to what we were using quite a bit before photonovelas and continue to use, which is SMS or text messages. How are they engaging with text messages? Who is, who isn't? Um, 
we've been using these for years and we have seen that there are certain segments who don't engage as often, who don't respond to these messages. And we've also done some analysis on who these subgroups are. And we found that they are typically those with higher barriers based on social determinants of health, as well as Spanish speakers. So we were particularly interested in reaching them to get them to act on the information being provided, especially since lower health literacy has been associated with negative health outcomes. So we wanted to see if by adding a visual story, which is basically combining text and pictures, we could increase engagement to create storylines in which characters might ask questions that you would be perhaps too embarrassed to ask yourself to address myths and misunderstandings within the story and hoping that this in turn would improve awareness of health issues and preventive behaviors. We also hope that photonovelas could transcend cultural and linguistic barriers. So here we are. We wanted to help build content that was layered. I'm gonna walk through what these are exactly, what are mobile photonovelas and why is this relevant? But the key here was we wanted to ask questions that we wanted to address questions that might be sensitive to ask and quickly build knowledge at the same time. So what are photonovelas? Um, they've been around a long time, as many of you probably know. Um, we knew based on research going back for decades that the visual medium and the cultural storytelling approach can make a big difference to the impact of a message. And we also knew that this has been used primarily with Spanish speakers. And that was what was interesting to us. We wanted to be able to use it with Spanish speakers, but also with the English speaking population and see what the response would be. Um, looking specifically at some work that has been done by the USC School of Pharmacy, that was part of what motivated us. We looked at their research um, in which they started way back, I believe it was around 2006, to create these, their first one is I believe this one, Sweet Temptations. Um, it, it was highly successful. It focused on diabetes management and the risks and the myths associated with the disease. Um, I think it was actually updated about 10 years ago again. But these are print photonovelas, highly successful, but they are things that you would maybe pick up in the doctor's office when you went in for an appointment. Um, glossy pamphlets, very engaging, fun to read, great storyline. So we wanted to adapt this approach, see if we could do this using your cell phone, have it as a mobile photonovela. But we also wanted to understand if it had been expanded beyond um, the Southern California uh, population so that we could perhaps expand nationwide. And one of the things we found was that it was replicated, that the same exact photonovela, Sweet Temptations, was used in the Netherlands by Dutch researchers um, who translated it uh, to Dutch and found very similar results. So this was exciting. Um, it told us that this photonovela approach transcends language and culture and can be effective, at least at this point in Spanish and English and Dutch. So that was all we needed as the impetus to start creating our own. So what are mobile photonovelas? Well, they're digital stories on your mobile phone. Um, they intended to be fact-filled, um, heartwarming, occasionally funny. You basically scroll through about six to eight frames to follow the storyline. And the goal is really to try to influence mindsets a little, to make a case that you can take care of your own health. Um, and we do this on a wide range of topics. Way back, as I mentioned, in March of 2020, we, we decided to launch our first photonovela campaign. And that was around health-related, uh, well, it was around prevention messaging. It was very much a public health type of approach to influence um, attitudes and beliefs and intentions um, around how you could be safe during the COVID, the early COVID pandemic. Another point I wanted to make, and that's the last one on here, is that that layering of visual and text also reduces cognitive effort. And we have received feedback on this, especially from our older users, as well as those who, are, who have disabilities telling us that they found it a lot easier to process when they have that combination of the visual and the text. 
So I'm going to run through an example of our first photo novella, the one that I referenced. This was developed very, very quickly back in March 2020 uh, because it was urgent to get the message out. And you can see the user experience as they scroll from fr frame to frame. So over here, I'm going to be going from left to right, uh, just because that's the shape of my screen. But the way the user would be experiencing this is they're scrolling and going from top to bottom. So they, they got a text message saying, hey, we have um, a helpful story to help you stay safe and, and manage um, COVID. Why don't you just click on this link? And they click on a link, which takes them to the story that's on their phone. So they're viewing it right there. Um, and you can see the story here. It starts out where he's at work and there are two people speaking. And um, we wanted to, again, on this one, uh, address the, the fact that there were differences in perspective based sometimes on age as well, as you will see as the story unfolds. Um, he's saying, I think it's scary. We're trying to emphasize that the CDC back then and throughout our messaging has been one of the best resources for staying up to date. They talk some more, as you can see, he's saying, well, people my age, um, he, well, I don't think it's a big deal for a young guy, right? And then the older person's explaining how you could spread it. Again, remember this was a long time ago, so we didn't know any of these things. Um, emphasizing the need to wash your hands with soap and hot water for 20 seconds. And then we move on to they leave work. He gets ready to shake hands and he says, no, 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 not so fast. Um, they do an elbow bump in the elevator, emphasizing the elbow sneeze. And um, we get to the end where they're talking about not being able to attend the potluck dinner they had planned on. And she's thinking, well, you know, I'll cook a special dinner as a surprise. So we like to end with something a little fun or lighthearted or just heartwarming. Well, and Rena, I really like this because, you know, you can see that we're, you know, really following the recommendations and, you know, making sure that we're staying up to date, but also one thing that's, I think, important to note is, you know, this is really before the term social distancing was coined, you know, back in March 2020. And so the focus was so much on hand washing or, san you know, using hand sanitizer, you know, avoiding crowds, elbow bumps and things, you know, sneezing in your arm. And so um, yeah. I like to see just the development of, of how, you know, the, again, the recommendations from the CDC started changing and how we were able to align here internally an impulse of, of what messaging we wanted to send to patients and to members, so. Yeah, no, you bring up a great point. This was so early. Um, we didn't know what was coming and we um, were focused very much just on the hand sanitizer. This is the time when everyone was buying hand sanitizer and toilet papers off the shelves. It's very much late March, early April, although that continued for a while. But let's fast forward to about two months later, and I'm not gonna run through each of the photo novellas. I'm gonna show you a few more examples, but I'm not gonna scroll through now that you've seen that user experience. But this was a really important one. Um, this was about two months later, May, 2020, where we realized that this is here to stay for a while. Um, and we need to be there for our members. They're facing some, a lot of mental health challenges just with these stay at home orders. So let's, we went well beyond personal hygiene messaging to supportive messaging and stories to help patients and members get through this long and difficult phase um, of being basically mostly at home. We call this our social isolation outreach. And as part of this, they could view little stories or vignettes of people in their neighborhood. Of course, it's made up. It's, not, it's just um, to make it sort of fun, um, who were also taking small steps to stay positive and healthy. So the idea was you got the text message, you click to see this first one, and then you can take a tour by clicking on any of these houses. You can kind of start with one and run through all of them to see what people are up to. And there were six mini stories that were basically connected in this single photo novella. So we can run through those so you can get a, a kind of a flavor of, of all of them. Um, well, funny, I should say flavor. <laughs> this first one is actually about cooking. So um, in this one, it's a simple story where Chris wants to cook pasta using his mom's recipe. He's talking to his mom. Um, Lisa jumps in and says, she wants to take over because that's, you know, and he says, no, 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 I'm the pasta chef. Anyway, it's meant to be fun. At the end, um, their daughter, I think her name is Mia, steps in as the real chef. 
And then at the end of the story, we've got a few tips um, saying chances are you will be cook cooking more at home. So here are a few tips. Try some new recipes, maybe cook extra food because so many people, this was new. They weren't used to having to suddenly cook. They weren't used to all these extra people in, in the home. And how does this even relate to your health? Well, it did. It was, people were feeling more depressed. People were just not as inclined to do the things they usually did. And so we were trying to get at it sideways here using um, these photo novellas. Let's look at another one. This is the big project, trying to get people to try new projects. Um, here, Tony plans to fix the kitchen cabinet. Um, Max, of course, has other plans. He thinks he's building a box for his treats. Again, it's meant to be funny. It's nothing, nothing super deep, but just say, hey, try something new. Um, and again, we got those little tips at the end, take advantage fix that ca kitchen cabinet, maybe add something for the dog and we make some other suggestions. And what's interesting is, and I'm gonna go through a few more, but in response to these, we got so many people texting back, telling us about the projects that they decided to take on as a result of just these simple ideas and reminders. Um, and that was really what we were going for, that little bit of nudging, um, getting people out of their current mindset, which was a little bit of paralysis and just watching the news all the time to just maybe break away from that somewhat. Here's another one in which Frank is sick of cleaning the garage. He's done it enough times. He wants to try something new. Well, Esmeralda has something else in mind and says, why don't you pick up a new hobby? And before we know it, he's, he's knitting again. <laughs> um, you know, just, just having fun with these stories, but suggesting that people try a new hobby, maybe even look online for materials you can buy on a budget. In a later text message, we followed up and people talked about trying origami, trying all sorts of new things as a result of these, these stories. Um, and here's another one. And in this one, we're trying to stay active while being safe, um, trying to encourage people to get out of their homes, um, we knew people and we knew people were feeling some anxiety. And I know Mel, you as a social worker, probably yeah. have much to say on this as well. well I really love this, this one, this vignette, because I think it's really important that while, again, we're encouraging folks uh, to, you know, to have new hobbies and to try cooking, but also getting out and, you know, smelling the flowers and getting some fresh air was super important in terms of just, you know, managing folks' anxiety about the situation. Um, you know, we all knew that even us, who, who felt, um, you know, I think everybody felt some sort of uh, anxiety and, and depression in, in terms of, you know, staying inside and making sure that we stayed away from, from large crowds. But this was super helpful to just say, hey, it's okay to go outside, take a walk, um, you know, getting some fresh air and helping them feel a bit more balanced in their mood. And you can see that there's a little bit of humor at the end again. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Where he says, I can't wait to show off my mask tan line. <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't think anyone wanted to do that, but yeah. Moving on to the next one, we're going to focus now a little bit on how we used telehealth, e-visits um, to help people who were putting off important, uh, putting off concerns, uh, too worried about going in because they didn't want to get COVID. At the same time, obviously, there were things that they needed to be able to bring up with their provider. So in this case, we're just walking through the telehealth e-visit process and really emphasizing how it's important, especially for telehealth, to be prepared, um, to, to know what to expect. Um, and as you can see in this fourth frame here, try to reduce noise, find a well-lit area. Of course, now, months later, with the amount of um, Zoom calls we've all been on, we're so used to this routine, but it is important to walk someone through, especially if they're nervous and have never done this before. Um, and so again, we're walking through showing that this was more of an informational one uh, where you could even text at the end after viewing it, text the word virtual and get lots of tips that would just be on your phone to help you when you did set up that actual telehealth appointment. Um, the next one I'm gonna go through is one that we did much more recently. This is a whole year from when we did our first photo novella, but here we're talking about a vaccine outreach. Um, and tried within this story to address issues around trust or mistrust, vaccine hesitancy, 
and to use trusted figures like Dr. Fauci or your own doctor within the story. Um, the, the story is focused very much on influencing beliefs, on uh, reminding characters of what they stand to gain, um, cooking together, for example, again. So highlighting those benefits, um, sharing meals at each other's homes, and then at the same time, addressing common concerns like possible costs associated with the vaccine. Um, again, it ends with, I need to keep reminding myself there's light at the end of the tunnel and getting vaccinated is our way out of this. So it was a very strong message. And we wanted to see how people would react. We knew that there were gonna be some very distinct groups or personas. Um, and we did see that in the responses to this. There were some people who were completely ready to go, were just waiting to get their chance. Others who were very much in that, I don't know, I'm not sure, I wanna wait a bit. And then finally, there was the third group who said, no matter, no matter what, I'm not doing this. I don't trust vaccines, I don't trust the government. So we, we were able to identify that by asking some follow-up questions as well. Um, so this was kind of the, 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 the storyline. Um, actually, this isn't specific to the vaccine. This is a similar approach that we've used on all of the photo novellas. This particular example is the one we used with social isolation, but we use something similar for the vaccine outreach. For the social isolation, we said, hope that was helpful, tell us what you thought. And people could just with a simple one, two, three, four, respond and tell us what they thought. But I would say about a third of people who did respond went well beyond that to give us some very substantive feedback, which was again, really helpful in understanding whether this was in fact hitting them in the right way. Um, and then for that social isolation one, the one with the six homes, we said, do you have a story you'd like to share? We'd love to know how members are managing while staying at home. And we're gonna actually share a few of those stories a little later on. Again, very surprised to see how many people wanted to share what they were doing to stay sane, to stay positive, to keep their health up. Um, an example of how often there might be a follow-up text message pointing them to really useful resources. And um, in this case, they will, and we often do this, we link them to the CDC. So here are the engagement levels across the four, uh, well, it's not really engagement, it's more of a response, I liked or loved it response. But what we found was that for those who responded to this question, hope that was helpful, text back your thoughts, loved it, liked it, it was okay or didn't like it. Um, that across the board, there was a very high percentage who either liked or loved the experience. The first one was the one where we were doing preventive measures, hand washing, 82% liked or loved it, social isolation with the six homes, e-visits, 85% found it very helpful because many of them were getting ready to set up their first e-visit, a telehealth appointment. And then vaccines, we didn't expect as many to like or love that experience because there are some people who feel like I'm not doing this no matter what and I wait, is this propaganda? Which it wasn't at all, but you can perceive it that way. So we did have a slightly lower percentage, but it was still a, a pretty robust um, number of, of positive responses to that. Rena, a couple of questions from my end. Um, so are there, are there certain subgroups engaging at higher rates than others? Like, do we have any of that data? So that's, that's a really good question. And that's exactly what we wanted to know as well after these first few photo novellas, because we had set out to reach more um, either disengaged, underserved, just members who we weren't hearing from. Uh, were Spanish speakers more engaged? What about those who were experiencing barriers relating to social determinants of health? What about older, disabled people? Mm -hmm. um, to that point, I'm going to actually share a few results here from these different campaigns so we can see what we found. Let's go back again. First one, um, simple steps to stop the spread. This was the hand washing and uh, elbow bumps. We actually have large numbers here. We had 144,000 Medicaid members who were targeted. That's a pretty robust number. Engagement rates, higher than usual at 14%. Um, what does that mean, engagement rate? That means people who actually clicked, viewed the photo novella, responded to the outreach. Um, by adding this additional dimension, we really bumped up engagement. Um, 
since this was our first in outreach with Foto Novellas, we were focused more on just plain engagement rates. We weren't really looking as much at who was engaging. We wanted to wait and just see if this even worked across the board. And clearly it did um, with us with 82% loving or liking it. Um, a, a good percentage also responding to that follow-up survey. And people told us, as you can see from some of the responses, that they told us where they stood. Most people were very scared and terrified at this time. But at the same time, they were going beyond this and telling us what they did as a result of this photo novella. We had, I remember, we had a, a grandmother who told us she'd scrolled through a few times and loved it so much. She was using it as a guide and was sharing it with her grandkids. You know, so <laughs> I don't know how many grandkids are used to having their grandma share, you know, something on her phone, a nice story like this. But um, basically, there was a lot of sharing going on. People weren't just viewing it on their own. They were, I don't know if they were sharing it by sending the link or if they were sitting together and sharing it but we just know that there was a lot of that going on which was exciting to hear so now we move to that second one which was social isolation and this is where we start to notice some interesting trends we targeted 85,000 it was a mix of medicaid and medicare very large percentage of disabled members within that medicare group um, so within that medicare over half were actually disabled Medicare. So this was, this was uh, something we wanted to understand. Would this work with an older population, a disabled population? And there were also Spanish speakers in this group. Uh, and as I mentioned, they have historically had slightly lower rate, uh, engagement rates on our text campaigns. But what we found here was that with the photo novella, they were engaging at much higher rates. They were 1.6 times more likely to click on the photo novella link. And the Medicare population were at, again, a much higher rate at almost 15% compared to the usual, which was under 8%. And I thought we, it would be nice to share a few of the responses we got in, to that question where we said, do you have a story you'd like to share? Since whenever possible, we want this to be a conversation, not that one way outbound message. Impulse is really all about conversations. Um, and so we said, tell us, what are you doing? We'd love to know how you're managing while staying at home. And here are some of the sample responses. And it's really interesting to see how people are willing to take the time to text pretty long responses. Um, we got thousands of responses um, to these questions and to this question. And, and, it, and again, it's really heartwarming to see that. But it also for the client was very, very helpful to understand how their members were managing during this challenging time. Um, so for example, if someone said, I am having trouble, um, and there were some who said, I'm having a really hard time. I don't have enough money for food. I have diabetes. I'm trying to choose between whether to get my diabetes meds or get food. Um, the, the health plan in this case was able to actually go and do some food drops to triage a lot of these responses coming back, identify with their behavioral health department who needed more care and then actually follow up. So this ended up being um, a very valuable program on many, many levels. Moving to the third one. Um, I know there's a lot we're doing here, but it, 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 there's much to share. And so I'm just gonna run through this and then if there are questions, we'll take them at the end. So this is going into a little more detail on the last two. This was the telehealth and e-visits and the client chose to pilot this with only um, Hispanic and black health plan members which was um, interesting because now we have data on just those two subgroups. It was a total target population of almost a little over half a million. Um, they were all ages. So we went all the way up to um, over 60. I think this one went up to almost 100, actually. And it started pretty young uh, at about 18. Um, but what we noticed was that clicks and views were more than twice as high at 22%. Um, when compared to younger members. For those who were over 65, they were clicking at a 22% rate. Um, we hadn't seen such a dr drastic difference. Again, did some probing and follow-up questions and they said, we find this a lot easier to follow. Thank you so much. Um, it's, it's just uh, easier on the eyes. So again, this was validating um, what we had seen in the print format. It was validating what we have done on the other outreaches, but basically we were finding that across language, across race, uh, people were 
clicking at, at high rates. In fact, as you can see here, we had an even higher click rate among Blacks and Hispanics, which validated, again, what the Dutch study has said, which is that this is appealing across all levels. And it's um, something that we then started to use even more with every segment of the population. Moving to this next one. Um, oh, I wanted to just share one other interesting point. This was a regional outreach, I'm sorry, a national outreach, but we did look at different, the different geographies within the outreach to identify different levels of engagement. And what we found was that the most engaged subgroup were um, older, in this case, 60 plus female, black, and in Southern California, who had an extremely high click rate, which was more than one in four actually clicked and viewed the photo novella. Again, it suggests that older people, older members are very interested and capable um, when it comes to clicking on links to access useful information. Hey, Rena, we have a quick question in the chat. Um, sure. Oh, I, you just brought it up. The click rate, yes. So those that clicked on the photo novella. The click rate, yeah. The click rate is referring to those who clicked on the photo novella link, um, which took them to that story that, that basically walked through, through what that process was. There were many people who were waiting to do e-visits or telehealth, but just a little nervous about the process. And there were questions that came up that helped guide um, some of the tips we provide in this, where we say tip, um, uh, text um, tips to get more information. Questions around, what if they don't speak my language? I'm a Spanish speaker. What if the person, the provider doesn't speak Spanish? Um, will someone else be, is it private? Um, I'm not sure that I can be completely quiet in my room because I'm in a crowded home. Can I take it from my car? So we had all kinds of questions that came back that, and that goes to a separate part of what we do actually at Impulse, which is I'm talking more about the photo novellas, but we have we talked about conversations. Well, you can't have a conversation if you don't really understand the question coming your way. So we have some uh, pretty strong natural language understanding, which is basically a fancy way of saying we are able to pretty much get what you're saying to us within reason. So if you were listening for certain types of topics, um, if you say, I'd like to order a pizza, we probably won't respond well to that. But if you say something like, um, do I need to be in a, um, is it okay to take this from my car? We can recognize that as a question relating to e-visits. And then we have, it's sort of like an FAQ set of responses that we can in real time on an automated basis be able to respond with. And so that, I know that was a little bit of sidetracking there, but to get back to the clicking, all clicks here were clicks to the photo novella. Um, and they're broken out by race, ethnicity, as well as gender, race, ethnicity. Another interesting insight from this one is that males were, we typically get much higher engagement from females and males on our text messaging, but they were much closer um, on the photo novellas. They did seem to get a kick out of uh, scrolling through these stories, which was nice to see. Um, here are a few responses we got when we asked them after viewing the photo novella, um, do you think you're more likely to try and e-visit in the next few months? And we got 6,000 plus members who answered the question, and I'm going to just share a few of those here. Um, absolutely. Different versions of that. I'm going to give it a try. Um, I'm scared to go to a hospital or clinic right now. It seems pretty easy to use. Well, that was our goal, to show them that it was easy to use. So that's exactly what we were trying, where we were going with this one. Um, yeah, for now, during the pandemic, I think I do want to try one in the next few months. Um, yes, I will be more likely to try an e-visit. Um, here's someone who's already tried it, um, loved it. And then we've got the I don't know groups, which we always have, saying I don't know, but I might try. I'll see when the time comes. Depends on the, the issue, which makes a lot of sense. Some things are better evaluated in person. Um, and then the ones who say no. I would rather talk to a real person and hopefully they were able to wait long enough to do that. Um, hope I will need it, but it's good to have. So again, it shows you the kinds of data coming back that helps inform future development of these photo novellas as well as some of our natural language understanding so that we can respond in real time to some of these incoming responses. Um, I'm gonna go to the fourth one, 
And okay, we're, we're getting really tight on time. I'm going to rush through this one. So apologize, but we're, we're getting to a little beyond where I thought we would be at this point. Um, this is the vaccine hesitancy. Wanted to just highlight a few points on this one. Um, you can see that on the left, we're seeing who was targeted. Just it's a basic heat density, population density map. On the right, we're looking at, and this is Cook County, Chicago. We're looking at where people live, but mapping it by social determinants of health. So we use an internal index. It's an STOH index computed at the census tract level and calculated from a zero, which would be very low need to a hundred, which is a very high need. And what we found was that for this target population of 100,000 members, um, the vast majority were in very high need areas. A few were in high need areas, but the average across this 100,000 member group was an 84.7, which tells you that there was, it, it was a, a underserved, under-resourced, just struggling population when it came to um, barriers. So I'm gonna just run through how we went into understanding where they might stand with respect to vaccine hesitancy before even sending them the photo novella. So we said, we know that the CDC would like you to get the shot, but tell us how you feel about it. Now, I'm just gonna run through this real quick. We had eight questions. The goal was pretty much to identify uh, perceived severity, susceptibility, what their health beliefs were, um, what their readiness levels were, and uh, whether they were on the fence when it came to this. And so, sorry, I do need to rush through, but you can see that there's a range of questions and they just had to share where they stood on them. Here are the responses to that. Um, the perceived susceptibility, severity, self-efficacy, which plays a big part in whether or not you're gonna get that vaccine. Um, and then even if you look at the bottom right, the, the social influence, um, my friends and family will help me decide. Surprisingly, most people disagreed on this. It was a very individual decision. But on most other things, um, the responses came in about the way we'd expect them to. Again, this is all self-rated, but very helpful because we use this to, again, build personas and determine who should get that photo novella. Separate question, how do you feel about the COVID-19 vaccine? And the way we asked that was when the COVID-19 vaccine is available and you could choose one of these. I plan to get it soon. I plan to wait. I don't plan on getting it. And you can see, and, and this green is going to just keep growing as time goes on because this was um, a couple of months ago and more and more people have vaccinated since. But we did have this group who said they didn't plan to ever get it. Um, for those who said they had already received the vaccine, we didn't send them the photo novella. Um, so this was a good way of just weeding out those who didn't need to get it to make sure that the messaging was appropriate. Instead, they got a follow up telling them they still needed to take precautions around unvaccinated people um, and to social distance. So here you get a few engagement metrics. Um, as you can see, we got 7.8% English speakers who clicked, slightly lower engagement, but not bad. But then you look at the Spanish speakers, and they're at 21.6%. So basically, um, we had it looks like almost three, but at least two and a half times as high a click rate among the Spanish speakers. And that was what we were really hoping to do. We wanted to reach the, the subgroups who typically don't respond, who don't tell us. And they were not just clicking, they were responding as well, telling us their feelings about it, loved it, liked it, et cetera, telling us what they were doing and when they intended to get the vaccine. Um, we then asked, are you more likely to get it after viewing the, vac after viewing the photo novella? And it was a resounding yes. Um, we did a little more analysis. We found that members were three times more likely to say yes than no. And so I'm gonna leave it there. Basically what we found was that with Spanish speakers, with um, people with high SDOH, with older members um, and even disabled across the board, we had higher engagement rates than other members in the population. And that, that was a, a very exciting finding. Um, I'm gonna just go through and talk quickly about how we deploy these. It's just a couple of slides, very simple. Um, we think very carefully at the outset about the target audience. Who are they? How old are they? Do they have special needs or preferences? Would a visual format be appealing to them? And which use cases are the best fit um, for this type of format? And finally, what are the most common barriers? Um, we have structural barriers, cultural, linguistic, psychographic, things like health beliefs, 
willingness to change. And then even things like patient physician language discordance, how do we address some of these barriers within a photo novella and perhaps a follow-up text message? How, do, how can one layer those to really make it a very comprehensive outreach? Um, this is the final slide here. Just wanted to share the process of developing these visuals. We develop a narrative arc. We develop an illustration style that fits the storyline. Should it be more realistic, more animated? Who are the characters? What do they look like? And then what are the scenes? We then come up, we write the script, come up with a storyboard in collaboration with the client because they know their members or their patients extremely well. So it's a, it's a very much a back and forth collaborative, very fun, exciting process. Um, and then we finally create that storyboard here where you can see there's the black and white sketches and then we gradually color in the scenes. When possible, we get some focus group feedback on this, make it again, not just collaborative with the client, but also with their members and patients, get some buy-in on it. So I'm gonna wrap up here, but that pretty much um, was a, a whirlwind tour through um, photo novellas, mobile photo novellas. Thank, Thank you, you so everyone. Much, uh, we have a couple questions that were answered that were asked in the chat and then one in the Q&A. So we sounds like we answered the one about click rates. Um, there was another question about the percentage. What percentage of older people have a cell phone and is this a limiting factor? Yeah, so that's something we've done a lot of work with. Um, and this is actually a separate project. We've done a lot with um, Kaiser Permanente with older members uh, where we wanted to make sure that they were um, able to click if needed on um, an embedded link. And what we find is that it's somewhere around, uh, it, it depends on the age band. When you get over about between 75 and about 85 is where some people are still using the old time phones. Over 85, strangely, I think because there's often a caregiver involved, um, they, we go back to the smartphone. So we're able to look at the devices when we send some of our messages out, we're able to see what type of device they have. But I would say it's a, a pretty high percentage. It's somewhere around 85% of the seniors who we are targeting do have uh, phones where they're able to click on this. And if not, they typically respond saying, I, I can't view this. And when that happens, we, we're able to send them a text equivalent. It's not the same which is why we try to layer this. So there's never an outreach that is only photo novella. There's always accompanying text messages to make sure that it's as inclusive and um, accessible as possible. Okay, perfect. Um, I've got a few more. Uh, someone asked, what platform did you use for the automated responses? So the automated responses, everything is part of the Impulse platform. So it's a pretty smart system where it's got that conversational AI built in. And so imagine that you say something, there's the, it goes through this layer of natural language understanding. Um, and then we have some built out automated responses that get served up immediately to the person on their phone. So it's, it's as if you were texting a friend and asking a question and they responded and they got it right. That's what we hope to do uh, most of the time. When we don't completely understand what you're saying, we do, we say that, we say, sorry, we didn't understand. But we try to keep that, sorry, we didn't understand, to less than 10% of the time. So our, it's sort of like our internal uh, goal, a mandate is to try to have about 90% of what comes in understood and responded to, to keep that conversation going and to continue to build knowledge, awareness, health literacy. Perfect, thank you. Okay, uh, another question about, um, were these photo novellas used across multiple health plans with members? or were they tailored for specific plans that contracted with you to create these for their members? So a few of them have, um, like the social isolation has been used across, I believe three different, at least two, but I can't remember if it was two or three, Mel, I don't know. Um, yeah, three, because we're doing another one that's coming up. So basically three uses on the social isolation, that was completely relevant for everyone. Um, the early one, the vaccine outreach, Many clients weren't able to get all their approvals in time for it to be still relevant because we didn't want to show people in the elevator. We didn't, because at that point we had moved into social distancing. But the social isolation was something that held its value for a much longer time. We have several others we haven't shared, things like flu. The intention is, and it is being used across more than one. Um, and of course, telehealth, e visits. So 
the vaccine outreach as well. So the idea is to make them as agnostic as possible, where it's not being tailored to a specific client, but can be customized. It's not that hard to add in a couple of lines if needed to make it feel like it's from your health plan. Perfect, thank you. Um, last question here. Hi, Rena. great presentation. How did the target audience respond to the infographics slash pictures in the materials? Did the audience feel like they could relate to the material? Yeah, for the most part, um, that was something we were watching very carefully. Did we get it right? Are we making assumptions about what the character should look like? And we have had, I would say I can count on one hand, um, the number of people who have not liked the actual characters, and I'm getting into some sensitive topics here around skin tone or the look and feel, that has not been something that people have reacted to negatively. For the most part, people have said, I love this. Um, this, this made me laugh, or this reminded me to do something, um, or to take care of my health. And I love the storyline. Um, so mm -hmm. I think we've, and, and we continue to evolve, and we continue to grow, and we're doing some focus groups too, more focus groups now as we develop these to make sure that it is in fact speaking to the vast majority of the members. You won't, you're not going to get it right for everyone, but we're trying when possible to, to, to have that, to have people resonate with it. And I can speak a little bit to this. Um, so one of the accounts that I worked with, they actually changed Dr. Fauci's name. So they, instead of having, you know, Dr. Fauci says that we should get the vaccine, they added, you know, my doctor. And so mm -hmm, some really mm -hmm. small tailoring um, yeah. we could do specifically for them. And this is from the leadership's perspective, their medical director had some thoughts and some questions. And so we wanted to make sure that um, they understood that we could make these. And so we, we made the small edits for them. Uh, looks like there's one other question. Um, did you use a variety of, of ethnicities in the images? How did this work? Do you match image or audience or use a variety of ethnicities? So that's, that's a really good question. And so if you take something like the social isolation, there were those six homes, six people in your, six homes in your neighborhood. We try to mix it up. So we had um, just about everyone in there. Now, the hope would be that over time, you're getting more than one photo novella from your health plan. And so one of them, yeah, they look a lot like me. The other one, no, but could be someone I know. We're not always trying to match the, the look and feel to who you are, but on things that are um, a little bit more, uh, where you need to feel like you're being spoken to on that level. Uh, so for example, we're doing a research study right now where we do know that 90%, sorry, 98% of the um, audience are Hispanic or Latino. We are making sure that that is front and center, what the characters look like. But when yeah. it's a more diverse group, you're going to have more diverse characters. So we're, we're, we're trying to be careful about this. It's, yeah, it's hard to get it right, though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, looks like someone, we have one other question. Um, have you tried deploying these through social media or any other way besides texting them directly to members? We have not put them and social media, they've just been texted. They could just as easily be um, on a website. I mean, this could be something that you go to a plan website and you see something that reminds you to get your screening and you scroll through the story and you say, oh, I want another one and you could click to the next one. So it could be on a website. We haven't really considered or explored using them in social media. None of our clients have asked for that, um, but it's something they could do. Yeah, I don't think we've Absolutely. emailed it either. I think it's only been through SMS. Text messages, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, I think there's another question. Um, sorry if I missed this, but do users have the ability to zoom in if the text size is too small for their device? So what they actually do is that they click the link and it brings up, and Rena, correct me if I'm wrong, it brings it up in your, your web page, right? So if you're using Safari or Chrome on your phone, um, and it opens up the images, and I believe that you can zoom in. You can, and on, on average, it's it's much larger than a typical text message even would be, and that's what that's the feedback we've received, which is this is a little easier for me to follow and to read. It's easier on my eyes, and then the accompanying picture helps often as well. But yeah, you can. Um, but the size is good when you see it on your phone. It's it's very readable. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look like that here. The resolution isn't as good on what you're looking at and the size is significantly smaller on, on these little images. Okay, any other questions? We're here for a couple more minutes.
Mm, nothing coming in so far. Oh, let's see. Um, someone just asked, are you aware of international work in this area? Rena, I think you talked a bit about um, the Dutch diabetes photo novella, right? There's a lot of international work. And in fact, I was just looking at a study that came out, I think last week um, in South Africa, where they reference USC in the Dutch study and now they're in South Africa, um, but it's, um, it's print, see, it's, there is a lot of work that's being done with print photo novellas where you're creating these pamphlets and glossy, really nice magazine-like stories that people can take from the waiting room. Um, the digital, I am aware that a couple of health plans have digital photo novella like infographics, actually quite a few do on their websites, turning it mobile. I don't believe anyone else is doing that. I'm not aware of anyone in the research, at least who's doing the mobile photo novella. Um, idea to make it to just serve it up on your phone you see it you maybe go back and look at it again later you can share it with someone um, and it's more timely because you're getting it perhaps right before that e-health appointment um, and so I, it's that element that I think makes it um, more actionable perfect Rena we have another question about um the illustrations it says I was wondering if you create the illustrated images and photo series in-house or do you pull from stock images? No, we create everything in house. Uh, we did experiment with stock images. So the one that shows photos of people and that's social isolation, but you can't get stock images where people are, they, everyone looks happy. They're all smiling. Um, <laughs> I think a lot of these are for, I don't know, commercial and they all seem to be, there's often a TV in the background. There's just a lot of very happy people um, in stock images and they don't follow a storyline the same way. So we experimented with that, decided, nah, this doesn't take it far enough. And I've had to really use, we have a very good illustrator and we use an illustrator for just about everything going forward. Awesome. Um, it looks like a couple more questions are coming in. Do you, any plans to incorporate mobile photo novellas with interactive technology as bots? Mobile photo novellas with interactive technology as bots, mm -hmm. as in... Um, Maybe like a chat bot. So I think, I think that this is what we did for the vaccine one, right? Um, we had a chat bot that- We after, did. After we did. After, but yeah, you can yeah we had a chat bot on that one and we named the chat bot Tony. Um, you know, that was supposed to be Dr. Fauci. We were trying to be funny there. Um, but the idea on that one was you got a lead in text message. It was layered. You then got the photo novella. We then came back a week later and said, hey, if you have questions, why don't you ask our bot? And you could just text Tony, get into that whole bot sphere and go back and forth and ask questions. And we had to keep populating that with up-to-date information because it changed from week to week. So that was a, a tough one to manage. But yes, that was a combination of text messaging, photo novella, and a bot because we knew people had loads and loads of questions relating to the vaccine. And so it wasn't enough to just say, oh yeah, you should get it. We needed to be able to answer some of those questions using and often refer them to the uh, deep link within the CDC website so they could get very solid um, up-to-date info. Yes. Um, okay, we have a couple minutes left. Um, just a quick reminder that if uh, if we drop before your question, if you uh, before you ask a question, you can reach out to us through um, the IHA folks through LinkedIn or even on the Impulse website. Just checking one last time here. Just some comments about someone using not photo novellas, but radio novellas in the uh -huh. rural community. Um, and someone's asking, are they radio station? Or are they are you doing them as podcasts? That's really That's interesting. interesting. Yeah, yeah. We do some work um, with our um, with our rich streaming. So what I had mentioned earlier, you know, our our health literacy streaming uh, suite that is kind of like the Netflix for that. We also um, use a podcast, and so there's uh, I think there's one for chronic conditions. There's one for there's a diabetes podcast. So that's super interesting um, that you would be using that as well in a rural community. A radio station for easier access is what they just mentioned. Mm. That's awesome. Okay. 
All right, doesn't seem like there's any more questions. Uh, thank you guys so much. Um, like, um, like Melissa said, if you all have questions afterwards, you can, um, you can also um, send them to IHA um, and we will, we will contact them and get, get answers to you. Um, we sometimes discuss this on the health literacy discussion list also, which is part of the Health Literacy Solutions Center. So uh, we love anybody who has not joined that yet to join it. Uh, there's a lot of interesting discussion. Um, and if, um, if Rena, if you could just go to the next slide, um, then there's oh, yes. just some final housekeeping. Uh, yeah, you can go to the next one. Uh, yes. So um, for anyone looking for CEU credits, um, you will get an email um, in the next few days and with an evaluation. And once you submit that evaluation, you will get your certificate. Um, and if you know if you have any questions about about that, you can go on the Health Literacy Solutions site and and um, call and go to the info email. Um, we will have a recording of today's webinar and um, registrations for new webinars in the future on that site. And again, thank you all for attending this um, and making this uh, uh, in, uh, a full robust webinar. And thank you so much to um, Rena and Melissa for your excellent presentation. I think this will be useful and I, I hope that we can see um, more photo novellas um, coming up as a result of this. Um, and I think, um, yeah, the slides will also be available on the website um, along with the recording. So just um, take a look at that. And again, thank you everyone, and especially to our speakers. That was really excellent. Thank you, everyone. It was a pleasure. Thanks so much. Have a great week. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. yeah. Bye, everyone. <laughs>